In this lesson, we'll talk about fundamental trigonometric identities and some applications. Recall the fundamental identities that we already have seen. As we know, identities are statements that are always true, no matter what input will be used. Here in this table, we have a list of identities that we already have seen. In first row, we have reciprocal identities. Those identities come directly from the definition of cosecant, secant, or cotangent. The second row reminds us about ratio identities. Again, from the definition, we show that tangent x is the same as sine over cosine. And since cotangent is reciprocal of tangent, so it's cosine over sine. The next row shows us Pythagorean identities. They are built on the fact that x squared plus y squared equals r squared for any circle with the center at the origin. So the first one is the most commonly used, sine squared plus cosine squared of the same angle is equal 1. But the other two is also good to remember. Secant squared is tangent squared plus 1. Cosecant squared is cotangent squared plus 1. And finally, we have a list of identities that are reflecting symmetries of specific functions. So we can observe that except for cosine and secant, which is reciprocal of cosine, except for these two functions that are even, the rest of trig functions are odd. So we can pull the minus outside of the function. And that's the main core of identities that we're going to use to prove some other identities. So if the instruction will be verify an identity, it really means to prove it by using the previous identities that we already know. How do we check if an equation is an identity? Well, we can do it in two ways. Either our equation is not an identity, so we can actually disprove it, and we can do that by finding an input value that will make the equation not true. So just finding one counterexample, one value that will make the equation not true. However, to prove that something is actually an identity, we need to transform equivalently usually one side of an identity, but occasionally you can transform both sides of the identity equivalently to see that these sides are actually the same. And what kind of techniques we can use to find appropriate transformations that will actually show that the two sides of the equation are equal. My first suggestion would be to actually perform indicated operations. So for example, if you need to add fractions, let's add them. Use common denominator. Sometimes you need to square one side to, for example, counter the square rooting, or we may want to use factoring. That's also quite often used strategy. The next technique would be, let's use the previously proven identities. So if we already know some identity, we can use it to prove the next one. If we have identity that involve different trig functions, it's a good idea to rewrite everything in terms of a single trig function. Particularly, quite often it's a lot easier to work with sines and cosines only. So we may want to rewrite all functions into sines and cosines. What else? We can multiply the numerator and denominator by a conjugate. Let's recall a conjugate we use in order to take advantage of difference of squares formula, because then we can square each term separately. And also, when we think about transforming the left-hand side of the equation, we should keep in mind the goal, that means what is it that we want to obtain on the right-hand side? So the right-hand side quite often gives you a hint which way to head. Well, let's start practicing. In the first example, we are asked to show that the given equation is not an identity. 
So to show that something is not an identity, it's enough to show one input that will disprove it. Let's look at the first example. We have square root of cosine square. If I take square root of something square, this actually results in absolute value of cosine x. And on that side, I have just cosine x. So it's enough to pick a point that will show that this side has a different value than that side. For example, if x is pi, then the left-hand side gives us absolute value of cosine pi is negative 1. However, the right-hand side is just cosine pi, which is negative 1. Obviously, 1 is not equal to negative 1, so this is not an identity. Let's look at the second equation. We have ln of reciprocal of sine. And on the other side, we have 1 over ln of sine x. So, for example, on the right-hand side, this expression doesn't exist as long as ln of something is equal to 0. But when ln is equal to 0, for what kind of input? Well, it's enough that this input is, for example, 1. If this is 1, that ln of 1 would be 0, so this wouldn't exist. However, 1 over 1, it would be fine, and ln of 1 would be 0. So, it's enough to pick a point that will make sine equals 1. For example, if x is equal pi half, then the left-hand side is ln 1 over sine of pi half is 1, and the right-hand side is 1 over ln 1. So, this doesn't exist because we can't divide by 0. However, that one is equal to 0. So, we don't really have equation. They can't be equal. Therefore, this is not an identity. Well, let's verify some true identities. We need to show that the left-hand side is equal to the right-hand side. We're going to use LS, representing left side, or RS, right side. Left side is the same as cosine square x, and then instead of sine square, we can use Pythagorean identity and replace it with 1 minus cosine square. So, this is the same as cosine square minus 1 and plus cosine square, which means it's the same as 2 cosine square minus 1, which gives us the right side. That's proven. So yes, that's a true identity. Let's see the second example. Left side is sine x over 1 minus cosine x. Well, in this case, maybe let's multiply by a conjugate, top and the bottom. What for? Because we want to get rid of this denominator, because the right-hand side doesn't have denominators. So, sine x over 1 minus cos x, and I'm going to multiply by 1 plus cos x, the top and the bottom. Let's see what this will give us. That's the same as sine x, 1 plus cos x, but in the bottom we have difference of squares, so we have 1 minus cos square x. But 1 minus cosine square is the same as sine square. Let's copy the top. So we are able to reduce one sign from here, one sign from there, and we end up with 1 plus cosine x over sine x. But then it's enough to rewrite this fraction into two single fractions. 
1 over sine x plus cosine over sine x. And we see that 1 over sine is really cosecant from the definition. And cosine over sine is cotangent. So yes, we've got the right side, which means the identity is proven. In the next example, we have two fractions in addition. Well, let's add these fractions. So left side equals common denominator sine square cosine square. And here we have cos square plus sine square. Okay, but sine square plus cosine square is the same as 1. So we have 1 over sine square x. And we can separate this times 1 over cosine square x. So as you see, the first fraction really represents cosecant square. And the second one, secant square. So yes, we have right hand side proven. And the next example, here we have sine, cosine, tangent. Well, maybe it's a good idea to change everything in terms of sine and cosine. So replace tangent by sine over cosine. So left side equals sine x plus sine over cosine. Everything over 1 plus cos x. Since this is a complex fraction, I would try to simplify this complex fraction by multiplying the top and the bottom by cosine. So when we multiply cosine through, it will be sine x cosine x plus, and this cosine will be reduced, so sine x over there. Over, the denominator stays as it was. Okay, so what can we observe here? We could factor the sign out as a common factor in the numerator, and then we have cosine x plus 1. And in the bottom, 1 plus cos x. Oh, that looks the same. So we can reduce this factor 1 plus cosine, and we end up with sine over cosine which is exactly what we wished for. That's tangent x, which is our right side, proven. And another identity. Now we have some absolute values as well. And also we have cosecant and cotangent. Well, let's keep in mind on the side that cosecant square minus cotangent square is equal to 1. That comes from one of the Pythagorean identities. But we don't have squares. Hmm, maybe let's force those squares. So let's start with left hand side. And instead of just cosecant minus cotangent, we are going to multiply this numerator by the conjugate cosecant plus cotangent in the top and in the bottom, cosecant plus cotangent. How this could help us? Well, let's see. We have ln, and in absolute value, in the top we have cosecant square minus cotangent square, which is really 1, over cosecant x plus cotangent x. So, cosecant plus cotangent looks very similar to what we have on the right-hand side, so we are closer to it, however, it's reciprocal. Hmm, but we know properties of ln. This could be written as ln of absolute value of cosecant x plus cotangent x, which is already what we're supposed to have on the right-hand side, raised to the negative 1. Well, that's great but ln of something to the exponent, we can pull the exponent out. So we can pull this minus out of ln, and yes, we have exactly what we're supposed to have on the right-hand side. So, it's proven. Fantastic. 
And the last example, it looks really complicated. Three terms in the top, three terms in the bottom. But the good thing is, it's only about sine and cosine. Well, what can we do here? I see this sine plus 1. The same sine plus 1 is here, but only part of the whole denominator. And there is 1 minus sine. That's another part that leads me to believe that maybe it could be useful if I multiply this part by a conjugate, 1 plus sine. Well, let's try. So left side equals 1 minus sine x. Let's treat this as one unit plus cosine x over 1 plus sine x plus cosine x. And let's multiply the top and the bottom by 1 plus sine x. See what will happen. So, this times this first bracket, it's 1 minus sine square x. And then plus cosine x and sine cosine over. And for now, let's rewrite the denominator as it is with no change, because who knows, maybe something can be reduced when we factor the numerator. So the first part, 1 minus sine squared is the same as cosine squared. Oh, that's good because we have cosine that repeats itself. Maybe let's rewrite this term first, sine x cosine x and plus cosine. Everything over and copy as it was. No change here for now. Finally, let's factor cosine out of the bracket in the numerator. So we have cosine x plus sine x plus 1. OK. Now we can notice that this bracket, 1 plus sine plus cosine, is the same as the bracket in the top. It's just written in different order. So we may want to even rewrite in the proper order. So we can clearly see that this bracket is the same, so it can be reduced, which is fantastic. OK, let's reduce this big three-term bracket. And what's left is cosine x over 1 plus sine x. Oh, that's great. This is our right side. So the identity is proven. As you see, some of the identities will require a little bit more fiddling, but never give up. As long as you rewrite your expression in equivalent form using proper identities, then sooner or later you will be able to show the right-hand side. So I gave you some examples here, but with identities, like with word problems, you actually need to do a lot of them to develop some sort of feeling what to do in specific case. So please do a lot of practice with those.